Good morning and welcome to this, the 96th virtual bridge session and uh, and dealing with uh, online delivery and the wonders of digital opportunity. And it's an exciting subject today. I'm pleased to wel welcome David Marshall from Southwest College. It's going to be talking about uh, game-based -based learning and uh, maybe giving us an insight into the auto skills VR uh, training for students and repairing vehicles, perhaps, uh, through uh, competitive gameplay. Over to you, David. How's it going, folks? Um... I'm David. I work in Southwest College, um, which is it's a large college, three different campuses based in the southwest of Northern Ireland. Um, and I work within a department called um, the Centre of Digital Excellence. So it is what we sort of specialise in is because we have distributed campuses is that my department would sort of bring a lot of stuff online. Um, so naturally, we are, we're basically the college now, <laughs> so we are. Um, during COVID, we, we, we have been flat out, so we have. Um, and I, I'm sort of responsible for game-based learning and in general, sort of external projects and stuff that's sort of um, new and exciting stuff. Um, so I do a bit of machine learning. I do um, games. I sort of specialize in a lot of different things um, but it's mainly games I sort of come from a game development background um, I did before I came here I was doing a PhD and um, brain controlled computer games so real future stuff um, and it was it was pretty interesting um, but it's a bit away in my opinion <laughs> so it is um, with the VR stuff I'm going to be showing you today um, it's all very current you can buy this stuff in a shop and set it up um but yeah so i've worked on a bunch of different stuff um developing applications for industry and the college itself so i've done stuff like virtual reality applications um for architecture i'm going to be showing you a bit of that um virtual reality training simulations for beginner mechanics so that's sort of the project that i've been working on for the last year um, called Auto Skills VR. I'm going to show you a video of that. And then I've done some AR stuff as well. Um, this seems to be, at least within industry, a lot of folks are very, very interested in AR just because of the application of you can stick this in someone's phone and suddenly you can use this to you know, label machine parts or measure a part of a building or um, in my case, it was using it to label parts on a machine. And we made, um, we made an application which allowed lecturers to essentially create the labels themselves. Um, a lot of the applications I would make, I try to keep them fairly customizable instead of trying to make them bespoke. Because I think if you make, if you make something too bespoke, um, you're only servicing one subject in the college. And that's something we try and avoid. Um, so like the labeler could be used for cars, engines, it could be used for, um, you know, even stuff like setting a table, you know, this is where you put this stuff. We used it for computer parts um, when we were testing it because I'm not bringing a car into the office. Um, so lots of different stuff like that. Um, so I have a little presentation here. Uh, it's sort of, it's a sales pitch on game-based learning um, because I think, I think for a lot of lecturers, they look at it and they think that's silly stuff. Why, why are we doing that? You know, we're here. Um, and this is sort of my sales pitch to a lecturer who's skeptical. Um, I'm just gonna share my screen here. Where are we, screen one. So just full screen this. Alrighty, so this might not be the best screen to show a skeptical lecture. Um, but yeah, so today we're going to be talking about game-based learning. So um, this is a ancient Chinese haiku. Um, so tell me and I'll forget. Show me and I may remember. Involve me and I'll understand. So that's a large group of learners. I think that applies to. Um, it certainly applies to me. Um, university, I would be the guy who doze off using um, during lectures. But when it would come to the practicals, that's when I find that I really learned stuff. Um, when you're sitting down, figuring out problems, 
learning sequences, just, you know, doing, I, I find myself just really, really picking up stuff a lot better that way. Um, so then just who plays games? Um, so before getting onto game-based learning, first got to tell you guys how many, how many people play games in the UK. So there are 36.4 million players in the UK, which is about 57% of the total population. Um, so there's a lot of gamers. Um, so on average, there are on average 11 to 64 year olds spend 8.8 hours per week playing games. Um, and the average age of a gamer is 31. So I think people's sort of stereotype folks who play games as this sort of teenage boy who's you know sitting in front of a games console and nowadays that's can't be further from the truth um just a lot of people especially when i'm pitching to staff say they don't play games but then will have sat and played candy crush on their mobile phones for an hour a day you know those folks are still gamers um and I, I certainly think a lot of people don't think of that as gaming, but it definitely is. Um, use the same techniques as your big AAA games um, to get people hooked in. So what does this mean to educators? So 57% of the UK population spends on average 8.8 .8 hours a week learning, playing computer games. Um, so if you deconstruct the fun in any good game, it becomes clear that what makes it enjoyable is the inbuilt learning process. So the reason, you know, if you're going through, let's say the first level of Mario, you know, naturally you're gonna hit the first enemies, you might run into them and die. And suddenly now you've learned those enemies kill me, I need to avoid them. And um, so you might jump over them and then the game will reach a point where you have to, you know, jump on one of those enemies heads to kill them. Um, you might die to it, then you might jump in its head. Suddenly you've learned that within the game, if you jump in the enemy's head, you kill him. Um, so stuff like that is just like basic inbuilt learning processes within games, um, which have always been there. And they're one of the main reasons I think people enjoy games. You learn something and then you overcome a problem. Um, so what is game-based learning and why does it work? So game-based learning is a type of gameplay so what gameplay is, is basically it's how players interact with a game. Um, if you're playing a shooting game, it's how the guns shoot and how you know, the enemies are affected by that. If you, you know, are playing a racing game, it's the handling of the cars and how you take corners. Um, it's just how you interact with the game. So game-based learning is the type of gameplay that has defined learning outcomes. Game-based learning is designed to balance subject matter with gameplay and the ability of the player to retain and apply said subject matter in the real world. So in other words, in, in my opinion, um, I think there was a lot of early game-based learning games, which were sort of, you play a game and you'd solve a math puzzle at the end of that game's level or something like that, or you'd solve a math puzzle during the game. I think, uh, in my opinion, and you can see it in a lot of modern game-based learning games, um, the maths puzzle is the game. Um, that's what you should be doing throughout the game, not as this side thing that you do. It should definitely be, you know, the, that core gameplay loop you should be solving those problems. Um, so what is game-based learning and why does it work? So players make mistakes in a risk-free setting. And through experimentation, they actively learn and practice the right way to do things. So players learn by failing. So a good example in our mechanic game is you could raise a car up above your head. You could just take the exhaust off and it could fall on your head. And that could be you, you know, you're dead in real life. Um, or you could, you know, take a bolt off in the car. The engine oil spills out everywhere. You've created a massive mess. You know, within a game, you can make those mistakes um, and the game will tell you you know via feed visual feedback um, that you have you know made a mistake um, and i think that's sort of core of what we're doing um, with the vr stuff is that you can get into a game you know muck up a hundred times but eventually you'll get it right um, and the time you get it right you're going to remember um, so 
players learn by failing. Um, so should game-based learning replace existing teaching methods? Um, so you can sort of see this was definitely pitched as at lectures. Um, so I, I don't think so. Uh, I think there's always a space in a classroom for traditional teaching methods. Uh, I certainly think like there's games out there now which will teach you how to play, you know, like Rocksmith will teach you how to play guitar. Um, and it's a large, you know, big, big game backed by a big company called Ubisoft. Um, and I, I think it'll get you so far, but I certainly think sitting down with the teacher and having him, you know, show you actual technique on the guitar is still something that's needed. Um, I've seen folks who've played that game and they hold the guitar in a weird way and play in a strange way. So you can't really teach that sort of stuff through a game. Um, a good example in the mechanic game is we can't, we can't simulate the weight of the tools. Um, there's stuff that you just can't, that can't be brought into that virtual world um, yet, I suppose. Uh, so game-based learning should be used in situations where it has clear advantages over traditional teaching methods. Um, so that's another big thing is that there's stuff that you can do in a game that you can't do in real life without, um, I don't know, without risk. So when should game-based learning be used? Um, so the game setting. So taking players to places that are not cost-effective to reach or that it is impossible to reach. So there's games that will take you to Mars or to the top of Everest. And you can use stuff like Google Earth VR to you know, be taken anywhere in the world. So we were able to take students you know, to Australia or I think we took students to New York before they got to New York. We took travel students to um, different places in the world so that they could sort of have a look at the streets. Um, you can go down into Google Street View um, and using Google Street View sort of explore a city. Um, so I think stuff like that is really, you can't do that in real life without flying the students to you know Los Angeles or something, um, which is obviously very, very expensive. Um, so, and then situations where it's dangerous for the player, um, that sort of brings us back to that mechanic game. Um, players can't really be hurt in a safe virtual environment. Um, so players, actions and objectives. So games excel in teaching sequences. Um, so we can train a player to you know, repair a car or to uh, cook a meal, even in VR, you know, you have these sequences set up. And then in a game, you know, naturally you can feel those sequences, you can muck them up and then we'll give you feedback on what you missed and um, on stuff that you're having problems with. Um, and that sort of analytics, being able to feed that back to the player and the lecturer, I think is very important. Um, so games are based on completing logical problems. There's always puzzles in every type of game. Um, and I think with those puzzles, you sort of can feed them back to, um, to games. So we actually ran, we ran some sessions with Minecraft. Um, and within Minecraft, there is actual logic gates. So you can do and or no or gates. Um, and we were able to use those sort of blocks within Minecraft to teach players how those gates would work in real life. Um, and then games encourage experimentation in a safe environment. But again, you know, you can't be hurt in a game. Um, and then games allow for unlimited repetition. So an example for our mechanic game, you know, it takes a lot of time to set up these procedures before the student carries them out. Um, so, for example, on oil change, you know, you would have to you know, set that all up for the student to do the oil change, for the student to possibly make a mess of the oil change. Um, but within our game, we just hit reload level um, and then that's ready to go for the next player. Um, and then games encourage competition. I think there's certainly been, certainly been a big resurgence of gamification outside of games. Um, you have different stuff like Strava and stuff, you know, encouraging people to go out and run. 
um, to compete against their friends. And I think using that competitive nature with um, game-based learning is a way to get students hooked in. Um, then sort of folks will say, well, what if you're discouraged um, by using competition? You know, what if you're terrible? Um, there's different ways within modern games where you can be matched against people of a similar skill bracket. Um, and we've been looking into that, you call that matchmaking ranking. Um, that's used in chess. So you don't, you know, you're not going up against grandmasters when you just start off. Um, so as well as games are a complex tasks to be taught in varying levels of simplicity. Um, so difficulty levels in a game, you know, we can teach a player something very basic, um, how to set up an electronic circuit or something. And then we can show them how to set up an electric circuit with a switch or with, you know, how to develop the individual components of that circuit. Um, so why now? Why is, why is this the best time to get into game-based learning? Um, so game-based learning tools are widely accessible. Um, many students own or have access to phones and computers. Um, I think certainly mobile computing power is, even for myself, I'm 30 years old, it's baffling. So it is, um, I have a phone on my desk that's more powerful than a computer I had eight years ago. You know, that's it's crazy, so it is. And most students now have these, you know, crazy good phones um, with, you know, four core processors can run all these fancy graphics um that they just wouldn't have had um so many years ago so I, I think certainly concentrating on the mobile aspect is something that i've i've sort of pushed towards um but then speaking of phones um it's very difficult to get students attention away from the phones so i suppose putting games on them you know overcomes that um as well as vr like you're able to get someone's full attention because you're essentially putting you know, a blindfold, a screen up on their eyes. They're not getting distracted by anything in real life when they're sealed away in a VR headset. Um, so today, game-based learning is accessible in many different industries for four main reasons. So there's the success of game and simulation-based learning in industry. So I mean, they've always had simulators um, within an industry. So they've had these large, you know, we, we've looked at stuff for driving these huge machines and quarries, um, drilling down into the earth. And they would spend, I don't know, I think some of those simulators cost over a hundred thousand pounds. Um, but nowadays, because we have a VR headset, you can set folks up with a VR headset and some custom tools don't need this big rig around you anymore. Um, and using that sort of hardware, you're able to bring the price of that stuff down. Then advances in raw processing power, these crazy good phones that everybody seems to have. Um, affordable games development technologies. It used to be that if you wanted a game engine license, you needed to be a major player in creating computer games or else you write your own game engine. Um, so nowadays, there's Unity, there's Unreal, there's lots of these free game engines out there, which for creators like me, who have very, very small teams, it's sort of caused this great growth in independent games development. Um, because suddenly I can make something that is comparable to something that a massive studio is making. And then finally, Games Analytic Insights. Um, I think this is something which might have been, I don't know, in a lot of games I've seen, it's been sort of ignored that you're playing a game, so you're able to track every single thing within that game. Um, so within stuff I've been making, I try and make sure that we can track, you know, an example of a mechanic game again, um, we can track the, every single mistake the players made, every single... Um, timing between each part of the procedure. We can track even what the player's looking at in the game. You know, is it the game's fault that the person's doing this wrong? You know, have they completely missed the point and are just mocking about? We, we can find that out now. Um, and then finally, I have a little video to show you guys over here. 
So this is sort of, it's just a quick showcase of what I've been talking about. Um, so we have these architectural visualizations here. This was a school um, that was yet to be built. Um, and an external company came to us and sort of, they wanted for us to be able to show the school to the students of the school, but they wanted, you know, fun activities in it. So there's different stuff, like we have a basketball game in it. The students can go and play in their hall before it's built. You view the surroundings of the schools, so that's accurate surroundings. Um, we have all these different modes within it. Um, so they can go into a classroom and they can sort of decorate the walls, they can change up stuff within that. So this was made um, by just me and a designer. So that sort of shows you that you can get these experiences with you know, relatively small team. Um, then you can see a model of the school, pick it up, have a look around it. Um, there is these, you can do this um, built in to the architectural software, but one of the main reasons the company wanted this sort of bespoke experience is stuff like this, you know, you can see through the walls, you can see the different components of the parts. Um, so this here was a learning management system game. Um, so this here is just a wee game to teach people how to get through their first interview. So it's a little mobile game at run in browsers, run on your mobile. Um, I didn't put myself in the game. Um, that's actually lifted from my profile on the learning management system. So again, this is all tracked um, and sort of fed, all the data is fed back, you know, all my answers, all my scores in the background. Um, is all fed back. So there's our AR labeling application. Um, so we use just a simple QR code one here, I think. With a lot of phones, you need, you know, a certain standard of phone to um, not use a QR code. Um, so we're just using a simple QR code to label stuff. So again, that's a computer there. We can label all the different parts. If we open up one of those parts, then you can see videos. Um, it's all on a tablet. It'll work on old phones. It'll work on new phones. As long as it has a camera, it's good to go. Um, so I think that's sort of a good example of this sort of customizable nature of some of the stuff we're doing. Um, so I, we sucked our computer. That's what we know. Um, and then this is our VR mechanic game. We've got this big garage here, our car, we've got leaderboards, um, guided tasks up on the wall. So you can do a lot of different stuff in this. Um, it's us raising up the car, you can sort of inspect parts. So having a look at the wheels, we've got these, um, use the instructions to sort of fix the problems. Now, one of the main things with this game is we wanted that to have physical tools. We just didn't want the player to like click on something and for it to happen. So as the player is doing that, they're hearing noise, they're feeling in the controllers, they can vibrate. They're you know trying to simulate the resistance of using an actual tool. Um, as well as we wanted that pop-up wall, we didn't want a menu. You know, I think for a lot of mechanics, they use their hands. So trying to keep the stuff as physical um, as possible was very important to us. Um, so you replace the parts, this is just replacing some brake discs, putting them back in, putting the wheel on. Um, and then this is all on scoreboards, so it is, you're able to compete with the folks in your class. Um, and I think keeping that competitive nature is important. Um, call myself hat there. Um, so up on the scoreboard. And then you can see all the different times for all the different tasks. Now, those analytics go a good bit deeper than that um into what the player is looking at and all these different bits but yeah that's what i've been at in southwest college i'll just stop sharing here folks there we go all righty so i suppose questions now or
Thank you very much, David. That was very interesting. Um, if I may jump in with a quick one, uh, obviously not all students have the same equipment, the same platform available. Um, how have you dealt with that in making, uh, as you said, the tools uh, more widely available? I think for examples like the learning management system game, that will run in a web browser on a very, very old computer, but you can sort of see the limits are graphics. You know, we can't really push for this big, shiny AAA game that some people will come to expect. Um, but I think you sort of got to aim low, so you do. Um, with the mechanic game, the way we got around that was the reason we actually have leaderboards in there is because the game's built so that you have a go, then you pass it to your friend, then he has a go, and you're competing via your times and that, that sort of you go by go way. You know, you pick it up at the end of a lesson, have a go. Um, I don't think we're expecting students to have VR headsets because it's all it's all far too expensive at the moment. So it is, um, and then just pushing for mobile stuff too. You'd be surprised like the students the phones the students have you know always baffles me they have better equipment than me <laughs> so they do thank you well, i was very lucky i got my vr headset quite a basic one but comfortable for six pounds in the closing down sale at maplin it's uh, yeah. belfast, Inter belfast international airport but uh, that's um, not an ongoing supply unfortunately <laughs> uh, would anyone from the audience like to jump in with a question there before kenji does <laughs> Feel free to unmute yourself and come in with a question or comment. Kenji's coming. So, so I've I've all I've played a lot of educational games over the time, um, and like my first educational game was in a fourth year, um, an O grade class of Latin, where I had to conjugate verbs <laughs> using a BBC micro B and um, select the correct um, sentence from a list and it, I think it was a hangman game now, so one of the things that about educational games is it's almost like the kiss of death to gaming it's like as soon as you put the word education next to games the the result is often there's an analogy of um, a chocolate covered broccoli that's the experience of educational games it looks good on the outside but the actual game itself is is ridiculously bad um, so, and you're right. And what you mentioned before about this idea of gameplay, uh, often like you had to answer a series of maths questions. And if you got all the answers right, then you got to play a game of yeah, Pac-Man for two minutes after you, <laughs> so yeah. it wasn't game. So that focus, you're, you're absolutely getting right. But what, what is it about, what, what did you think about in the design of your game to make it game, like game versus simulation? And, uh, and, and it's a very close area. So what have you done to make it a game as opposed to just a simulation? I think we, we sort of, we're pretty near being just a sim. Um, I think when it comes to the gameplay aspects, um, it's adding in that competitive aspect, so it is. Um, sort of, because students, those sort of students too, you know, they love racing. So they love the idea of getting a better time than someone else. So one of the things I actually didn't mention was when you make a mistake, you get time added to your time. So it's sort of like a rally stage, you know, you miss a bit of track, we'll add on a you know minute penalty to you. Um, so bringing those sort of like little aspects to it, which they can relate to um, and understand very quickly. I, I don't, I think like, you know, for that group, especially bringing in you know, all these gameplay sort of aspects for those folks who don't play games can be, you know, confusing. They'll look at it as a bad thing almost. I know for us, you know, folks who have played games, we love them. But for folks who haven't, you know, it can be very confusing. <laughs> so it can for the first time. Um, so I think bringing in that competitive aspect and just focusing on, you know, keeping those sort of little game elements in it. Um, sort of keeps us away from being a full sim. Um, it's something I want to avoid, avoid to be honest. 
kind of follow up on that uh, about the flexibility. As you said, the competitive element is uh, sometimes a key driver, but not for everyone. And um, yeah. I, and I can see how in the area of uh, motor vehicle uh, uh, maintenance, then probably you've got a good number of them who are competitive and go for that, but not yeah. in all subjects. Uh, does that have to be taken into account when uh, considering gaming as an approach to education? I certainly think so. Um, sort of one of the things that was mentioned earlier is that matchmaking ranking. Um, you don't want to discourage people, so you don't. Um, they use that in games as well, the skill-based matchmaking, you call it. Um, so you want to match players of a similar skill with other players of a similar skill. Um, you know, if I sit down with, I think Call of Duty is the big one at the moment, um, and I'm all up against these incredible players who've been playing for years and years and years, you know, and I sit down and I'm terrible at it, I'm not going to play that anymore. And I think that's the same approach you have to take with game-based learning games. Um, you want to put people up against folks who are of a similar level. Um, and even, you know, if they find themselves achieving really well in the game, you know, then suddenly you're seeing them jump steps maybe in educational level as well, um, which I think is interesting, you know, giving folks an opportunity or maybe level one on a course to compete against level threes and see how they do. Um, yeah, no, very interesting. And we've got time for one more question in the recorded part and Walter, I could ask you to come in there. Yes, David, uh, I'm interested in the, in the staff development that's required in order to implement. I mean, is it the case that a college would look to its learning technologists to do it for them? And in, in that case, how do they get trained? Um, I think with most games, well, with the VR stuff, I think the hardest bit is nearly the setup. So it is. So for the most part, with the VR games, like it'll take you through a series of steps to get there. Um, for a lot of them, they'll sort of, they'll have very rigorous tutorials, which will teach someone who's even, you know, even not technically inclined. Um, I even have in my room here a VR headset. Um, and essentially how to set this up. So you get one of these and there's two little lighthouses and you put them at opposite corners of your room and it'll take you through this all on the computer. Um, and it's pretty, it's pretty self-explanatory, to be honest. We, we've had lectures. I had a lecture who was probably not particularly computer literate, had come from, I think she was on the biology side of things. And I talked her through it for five minutes. And then she said to me on the phone, oh, wait, this is a tutorial. And she just flew through this. Um, so it's one of those things that I, I think folks initially get a bit, oh, no, this is new. Um, but within a game, you know, the tutorial's there. It's all there waiting for folks. Um, I think maybe initially getting a digital learning technologist in to show you the basics is good. But from that point onwards, the game, if it's a good game, will tell you how to do it. Very good. I'm going to have to wrap up the recording in a second, but um, just uh, it would be good to know um, what are your plans very briefly for dissemination and making this available to the educational community outside Southwest College? Um, I think for the VR game, um, Auto Skills VR, we're going to plan and get it up on Steam early next year. Um, at least in a currently, we have 20 levels developed, um, and there's maybe the idea of sticking up five and then allowing colleges who want to test the full 20 to, you know, email me or, you know, I'll try and get users to have a go at them. Um, but it's just getting this stuff out there. I find difficult as an engineer. So it's, very, um, but it's, yeah, it's a tough process. So it is. Well, David, I think you've um, sold it pretty well as uh, being a, a very important, valuable part of the ongoing strategy towards engaging students. Uh, so thank you very much for that insight into game-based learning. I'll now draw the recorded part of this session to a close. Thank you very much for joining us.